thank you for joining us for Science Communication Toolbox for Researchers. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the land on which we gather to be the traditional and ceded territory of Algonquin Nation. This is where I am located here in Ottawa. And I know that obviously we are located in different parts of the, the world, uh, different parts of Canada. So I'd like you to potentially take the time to reflect on where you are located in the indigenous lands you might be living on or present on at the moment. There is resources that you can use to research, learn and, and find out more about these lands and uh, the people who live on them and have lived on them in the past and, and in their languages and other information. So I would invite you to, when you have the opportunity, take a look at these two websites. So the trainers, there is myself. I am the Knowledge Mobilization and Communications Coordinator for NSERC FEMFOSNET. We have Farah, who is co-teaching with me today, and she'll be doing a lot of the workshops. And we all have Alana Wilcox as well. And Farah Alana worked with me to put forward the proposal to get the funding for this program. So they've been involved from the outset and they know it inside out, if not better than me. And so it's fantastic having these two experts in science communication to help us deliver this course. And our two guest presenters are Julia Pollock, who's the founder and executive director of Art of Science. And she has her own company uh, that does data visualization, and graphic work for working with their clients to enable them to communicate visually some of their complex ideas. And we have Marianne Falado, who's a postdoc researcher at the University of Laval, who will be covering the community engagement workshop. And uh, yes, it's going to be fantastic one. I'm really looking forward to that one. We also have with us today Jesse Hildebrand. He's the VP of Education, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, which is an amazing program for schools that actually get scientists out in the field to be able to engage with classrooms and do it all online so that students can you know, see what's going on all around the world. They've got some special technology that enables the scientists to engage, which is amazing. And Jesse's also the founder of Science Literacy Week. So he's got a, a very uh, brilliant background in science communication, and he's going to be the one doing the evaluation of this. Jesse has said you can reach out to him if you've got any feedback, if you've got anything you want to comment on about the workshop. So you can reach out to him. I think everyone's uh, filled out the pre-program survey. So thank you very much for that. We will have some brief little polls, very quick little questions during the workshops to find out if you're enjoying them, if they're meeting your needs. And then we will be following up at a later date to find out if you've put any of the learning into action, if you've carried out any science communication and what you thought about it and you've had a chance to, to digest it and to think about it. That's the, uh, the overview of the course as a whole. And now I'd like to move on to Science Communication 101, our first workshop. As a little overview, we're going to be covering science communication in Canada. We're going to try and make the workshop relevant to the people in the network. So it's going to be primarily Canadian focus, not entirely. It's also going to focus as much as we can on permafrost and climate change related topics. We're going to be covering the fundamentals and key concepts in science communication and misinformation today in this workshop, uh, led by myself and by Farah. So an overview of how this workshop is going to progress. First of all, we're going to talk about what science communication is. And then we're going to look at uh, sort of our goals and objectives, what we're trying to achieve uh, and how to do that effectively. And then Farah is going to give us a little bit of a rundown on how science communication has really been evolving over the last decade and provide us some opportunities, organizations and ways that you can carry out science communication before diving into how much the public trust scientists uh, and what challenges we still face 
and science communication. So, first of all, I'd like to start with when science communication began. And this is a very interesting question. Indigenous people have shared their knowledge and their understanding of the world, their observations for, for millennia, for um, thousands and thousands of years. This, this image here that I put on this slide is something known as the Ashango bone. And it has small little markings on the, the bone. And it's postulated that these are a way of communicating ideas about mathematics, about maths. And it has been put forward that this is used to transmit knowledge, to share information, rather than just a simple uh, tool for tallying numbers. So this could be one of the oldest examples of a way of sharing knowledge and transmitting knowledge. In this case, mathematical knowledge. There's been a long, long history of oral communication and passing on information orally. And one of the oldest of these is a geological event that occurred about 30,000 years ago in Australia. And the ancestors of the indigenous uh, Yorta Yorta nation observed this event and the flooding that was involved and have already passed down the story of this event uh, ever since, which is, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's amazing that a, a geological event in the natural world could be communicated over such a long period. This really raises the question of, you know, when, when did science communication begin? And is, is all of this knowledge sharing science communication or might we want to, to call it something else? And how we would do that appropriately and respectfully? Uh, and there were a variety of different uh, philosophical and academic views on how we would appropriately and respectfully treat traditional or indigenous knowledge um, and how that fits in with communication of science and, and research, particularly in the modern era. And we provided a little reference there and we'll, we'll let you, um, if you want to look into this further, I would recommend this article by Lindy Orthia that sort of discusses and explores some of these questions and issues. What you may be more familiar with in terms of science communication, what you might think of when you hear about science communication is what you can see in this image here. It's a scientist in a, a lecture space, in a lecture theater, and they have a variety of instruments uh, on, on the desk there. They're giving a demonstration. And this is a public presentation. It's a scientist presenting to the public. And this is actually the Royal Institution in London, in the United Kingdom. And the Royal Institution was founded in 1799. And in the early 1800s, started putting on these public presentations. In fact, one of the oldest presentations are the Christmas lectures that started um, in the early 1800s uh, in the Royal Institution and have been going ever since. I think they, uh, they stopped for a year or two in the Second World War, but otherwise every Christmas uh, they've had this public presentation about science. And it was really the mission. The mission of the Royal Institution was to communicate and, and pass on information about science to the general public. So our modern perceptions of what science communication have very much come out of this era and have been influenced by the Enlightenment and the, the French Revolution and a lot of the sort of the politics and developments that were going on in the industrial era around this time. So we have a long, long history of transferring knowledge, sharing knowledge uh, in a variety of different ways. What I want to talk about next is what is science? Because if we're going to be communicating science, we really have to think about what science is and what we mean by science. We don't have time during this workshop 
to really go deeply into this question because it's a very, very big philosophical question and we can't possibly answer it. I don't think you will be able to answer it yourselves, but it's worth thinking about. And I think it's very important that when you embark on carrying out science communication, that you've already had time to think about how you perceive science, what you think it's going to be. So it's going to be very important when you do your communications, when you're talking about science, that you know where you're coming from, what you think science is. There are a variety of definitions, and there are a lot of misconceptions about what science is. So knowing where you're coming from and what you understand science to be will really help avoid too much of a disjoint between where your, your audience might be and what they think of science uh, and what you think of science. And, and being very uh, open and upfront about what you believe science to be can really help to avoid those sort of miscommunications. It can be very difficult as well to convey some of um, ideas about the validity of science, consensus around science, especially if uh, topics like climate change, where there's a lot of distrust and miscommunication. And so knowing what you think of when you think of science and in terms of things like consensus will be really, really important. So what we're going to do is I'm going to look at a definition. I'm going to show you a definition that has been adopted for science. I'm not saying that this is uh, an all-encompassing or, or correct definition, but it does help for you to start thinking about how you would decide on what science is. And it's primarily looking at knowledge and processes. So this is a definition created by the Science Teachers Association of Ontario and the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. And as you can see here, the primary goal of science, as they put it, is to understand the natural and human worlds. So it's a, it's a process by humans to obtain knowledge about nature. So you can see there that it's very, very important they're talking about process. Science is a, is a process and knowledge. Uh, it's a dynamic and creative history, and it also changes over time so that evidence can be challenged uh, with new data, new information, and it's not a static set of facts. Science is, is ongoing. We're going to take this little opportunity uh, to just have a small little pause to give you time to sort of absorb some of these ideas. And then we're going to move on and uh, talk about other aspects of science communication. Hopefully, uh, you've had a little chance to sort of take on board the idea of science and communicating science. And we can provide time at the end of this workshop to discuss that and go into that in a bit more detail if you'd like. Permafrost research is a multidisciplinary field of research. It involves a lot more than just science. So technology, engineering is involved, mathematics are involved, lots of different areas of research. And when we talk about science communication, really we're using science almost synonymously with the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and maths. So a lot of the same principles and ideas around science communication will be applicable. If we're talking about jargon, then we're going to be talking to jargon that might be used in technology, jargon that might be used in engineering, and some of the same principles will apply. So equally to help us, the uh, Science Teachers Association of Ontario have also provided definition that they have of technology. So the use of materials, tools and processes for solving problems, problem focused and orientated. And I think taking that on board is also very, very important when deciding on 
what we're trying to achieve when we carry out communications. What are our goals and objectives? And, and do they align with uh, our research um, and the work that we're doing? Are they trying to, to solve problems? When we think of science communication, we probably have a lot of different ideas in our heads of what that might be. I'm gonna quickly run through some examples of science communication, and it can't be all encompassing. I couldn't possibly cover all of the different types of science communication that you could think of. There are so many, it's become such a diverse field. And you'll also find that, I, I used this analogy the other day, that it's almost like a, a Russian doll of science communication nowadays. You may have peer-reviewed publication that's published in a, in a journal like Nature. That communication of scientific knowledge to, to other scientists and people in the field will then maybe be picked up in a newspaper and a journalist may report on it and then someone may tweet about it uh, and it becomes part of a conversation on social media. So all of these communications can feed into each other and build upon each other. One of the uh, very good ways of more directly communicating scientific information is through the conversation. So the conversation are articles that are written by academics. It's supported by universities. It's a non-profit organization started in Australia and is now publishing articles from universities around the world, places like the UK, Canada. It's um, similar and has some similarities, obviously, to things like op-eds. People will write in a newspaper and they will share their science and um, their research through a newspaper. You may think of interviews. In this example, obviously, I think most people have probably heard of Greta Thunberg. Interviews may be on TV, they may be on the news, they may be a talk show, they might be on the radio. It's a, another common way that people will discuss their, their work uh, directly. It's you know, coming straight from the individual being interviewed, the researcher in some cases. In obviously other cases, someone like Greta is, is not a scientist or a researcher, but they will be sharing information that is from science, and it may well be information that people think is scientifically based. We also have things like uh, documentaries, uh, films, movies. This one, for example, is sharing scientifically derived solutions and ways that we can uh, make the world, world better. And so it's taking actual research evidence and then turning it into a documentary to enable people to you know, take that on board without having to read peer-reviewed publications. It's a much more accessible and easier way of transmitting knowledge and uh, sharing with people. Uh, you're probably familiar with TED Talks. In this case, this is uh, Al Gore, who's obviously very, very well known for The Inconvenient Truth. He got the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for that. He's, he's delivered six TED Talks in total. So these are talks to a public audience. It's a presentation that is filmed and is then shared on platforms like YouTube. There is this social media. Here we have Merit, who is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's the director of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. And she's a very, very effective social media communicator. And it can be another way that you can engage in conversation and directly communicate with, with audiences. You may think of communications in terms of 
going and talking to school students, going to schools. I, I, this is something I've done a lot of myself. Uh, it can be very rewarding, very useful. You may think about writing a blog, having a blog where you can write about your science and have that shared. So Science Borealis is a good example. It's a network of Canadian bloggers. It enables you to write about your science and then share it to a wider audience. This example here is uh, very useful for demonstrating what I was talking about earlier. This is a social media post by Smart Ice, and it's about a community project to monitor the ice that engages the community in research and communicates ideas about science with that community and when they're doing the research it then gets picked up by a cbc show quirks and quarks and is, is then and tweeted about so it has a lot of impact in a variety of ways carrying out these sorts of communications we also have uh, things like comics and cartoons frozen ground is actually about permafrost there are members of the network who've been involved in this So comics and cartoons are uh, one of the ways that we can engage with certain audiences, can be very effective, very visual. Plays are another way that we can engage uh, with a different type of audience, the sort of uh, audience who, you know, who go to a play might be quite different uh, to an audience that maybe wants to engage via social media, for instance. This is a shot from a, a play by Chantal Bilodeau who's a playwright who focuses on climate change uh, issues and has done a whole variety of plays on, on the topic. Uh, we have opportunities to meet with the, the public directly. Soapbox Science is an event that has female scientists speaking uh, in the public. So it, uh, it's been held in the Byward Market in Ottawa, this shot, I believe, is from Vancouver. So scientists will go out and they will just speak to the public very directly. We have visual ways of communicating. These are warming strikes or climate strikes, as they're also described. So in 2016, climate scientist Ed Hawkins created some visuals of the temperature uh, rather than using numerical displays, he used uh, color. Uh, and these really went viral. They became very, very, very popular. They were applied to all kinds of different places. I, I've seen photos of uh, climate stripes on a car. But once again, this, this communication then gets translated. And in this case, uh, this is the Tempestry Project. And these climate stripes have been then interpreted into the knitting of scarves. And as you can imagine, being able to communicate uh, scientific findings or, or data in other ways can be, really enable you to meet different groups by using different methods. So by making knitting patterns, you can reach a, a new audience uh, and get them to engage with this data. What I want to talk about next is how you can be effective. And I think the best way that we want to start off any communications activities is developing our goals and objectives. And then we can look at our audiences, 
choose the tactics that we want to employ, and then try and approach it in a way that is evidence-based and is going to be effective because we've looked at the research on, on what is effective. So for this workshop, for myself, I'm wanting to think about my goal. My goal is that you are able to carry out more effective communication. So my objective will be that I develop better communication goals and objectives uh, for you to help you do that. Um, and to do that, I want you to think about your strategies. What are your communication strategies? And then you can find the skills, the science communication skills that you need for that. So what was really, really fantastic when we had our pre-workshop evaluation survey is a lot of people provided me examples of what they were trying to achieve, what they wanted to get out of this. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a lot of identification of audiences. So it might be the, the general public, it might be kids, it might be uh, Northern First Nation and Meti communities. So identifying audiences is obviously really, really important. And as you can see there, there's things that people want to achieve, like they want to engage with local communities so that they can talk about their field work. So thinking about what you're trying to achieve is a, is a good, good place to start. And really want to think about, are you trying to transfer some specific information? Do you want a community to engage with the research you're doing? So I've provided a little example here of the, what we sort of mean when we do this. If you want a better design collaborative research project that meets the needs of residents, your objective might be to foster trust and collaboration with Northern residents. And the tactic you would do that with would possibly be a dialogue session on permafrost monitoring research. So the skills you would need for that would be dialogue facilitation skills. You need to be able to work out how you'd set up a dialogue, whether it's an event, and how you then facilitate that to, to achieve the objectives and goals that you want. So knowing what you're trying to achieve is really key. It's probably one of the most important things that you need to think about rather than starting with some skills and you know learning about how you deal with jargon is, is very, very useful, but it's only as useful if it's going to meet the objectives and the goals that we're trying to reach and we're trying to get to. Thinking about your audience, we've already seen a variety of audiences have been mentioned. Audiences are generally referred to as the general public. It's the term that's commonly used. And yet, as we all know, the general public are very, very diverse. They're very, very different. And this is not a all-encompassing selection of the different aspects that you might want to take on board when you think about your audiences, but you might be able to narrow down and have a better idea of what are the needs um, of your audiences? How might they respond to ways that you want to engage with them and communicate with them if you've thought about some of these aspects? And things like uh, location, as you can see there on the bottom left, we have location. This might be a physical location, a geographical location. So you might want to engage with people who are in the north of Canada, but it can also nowadays um, just as much be an online location. Uh, you might want to engage with young people. And if you were to choose Facebook, you may be having less success engaging with young people than if you were to choose some other platform or some other place to engage with them. Uh, maybe if you were making videos on TikTok, you've increased your possibilities of engaging with the audience that you really want to engage with and therefore being able to achieve the goals that you want. Tactics. The way that you approach these things is going to be important. And there's two main ways of looking at science communication. They're commonly known as the deficit and the dialogue models. And traditionally, we might think of this, as you can see here, 
scientist has a message and they want to pass it on to the general public in this case. So passing on that information is the, the, the traditional model that you might imagine. As we saw earlier, that was the model in 1799. And the Royal Institution sets up public lectures of having a scientist pass on that information. However, evidence shows that it's far more effective and you're much more likely to have people engage with your work and to trust your work if you have a two-way form of communication. So if you're engaging with the public and you could provide a means to listen to them and to take on board their views and their ideas and thoughts around your work, then you are much more likely to have effective science communication. But this is obviously bearing in mind what your objectives are and what your goals are and the, the medium that you're going to use to engage with people. And the last little part of my uh, presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you then make all of this evidence-based. And I'm gonna give you two examples of research and how you would approach that research and how you'd incorporate it into the work you do. So first of all, I'd like to share with you research that was done with the Taiwanese public. This was published in a peer-reviewed journal, Nature Communications, specifically looking at how you label climate change, whether you refer to climate change uh, as a crisis or not. And this is what you would traditionally think of as research. So in 2019, uh, it became a commonly accepted in journalistic circles idea that there should be a change to the way journalists and people are referring to climate and that terms such as climate crisis be adopted. So the researchers decided they would find out if this was going to be effective. And they carried out 1,892 telephone surveys with a whole variety of questions to try and find out if this sort of labeling of climate issues was going to bring about things like behavioral change in people. And generally they found that there weren't big differences in labeling across most of the measures that they had, such as age, educational attainment, and uh, those sort of measures. And quite often things like educational attainment and age have been seen as proxies and other ways that you can see there's a correlation between trust of science and engagement in and scientific uh, alignment uh, and those who hold less favorable views of science uh, and research. They did, however, find that there were some differences in terms of gender. Generally, the, the male respondents were less uh, likely to respond positively to terms like climate crisis uh, than the female respondents. They also noticed that in some of the hierarchical uh, individualistic views of the participants had an effect. And I think it's very important at this point to point out that this research is, is good. It's very, very helpful. However, we have to bear in mind this was carried out in Taiwan. The Taiwanese culture will be different to the Canadian culture. They are noticeably more influenced by Confucian ideals. And so this does impact the way that they interpret a lot of these concepts and the way that you would engage and communicate them is likewise uh, needing to be adjusted. So you maybe wouldn't want to take this research and then apply it directly to any communications you do with a, a Canadian audience. So research is really important. Evidence-based communication is really, really important. But like all research, you have to be critical of it and you have to use it appropriately. So what I'd like to show you next is another form of research. This was carried out in Canada. So this is public engagement research. 
This research isn't published in a peer-reviewed journal, but it is very, very useful, particularly if you're going to be engaging with Canadians, especially if you're going to be engaging with Albertans. So as you can see, in this case, there was only 482 people who actually participated in this research. So, you know, roughly about a quarter of the number of people involved in the survey in the previous example. However, public engagement research enables the researchers to go into a lot more depth, collect a much richer data, get a much more nuanced view of people's ideas and opinions. And that can be really, really helpful when it comes to crafting your messages and the way you want to approach the communications. They held lots and lots of uh, events. So they held lots of workshops, lots and lots of conversations, 120 hours of conversation. There's a lot of people involved and trained. So this was really a much richer and involved program. Now, there's a lot of uh, outcomes from this. I'll show you a couple of the sort of highlights of this. And, and I would say that it's very useful to maybe take a look a little later uh, in more detail if there's things you want to know about the Alberta Narratives Project. What they did is they distilled this down into successful and useful language and less successful language and less successful ways of having conversations and talking to people about climate issues. People think that climate change is important. It's not maybe the top most important topic. So they do still think it's very important, but not the most important. And you can use that to, you know, temper maybe the way that you talk about your research. Maybe not overemphasizing its importance will, will help, will maybe enable you to make connections and get across the messages that you do want to get across. Making it a, a yes or no option, that you've, you've got no, you know, no choice, you have to do something, that's not gonna go down well, it's not gonna help you build bridges. So they had a variety of these. Albertans generally see climate change as an emerging challenge as opposed to an immediate threat. They like straight talk. This is one of the other findings. It's not surprising. A lot of researchers found that jargon is ineffective at communicating science. And this was found here. They didn't like jargon. They didn't like euphemisms or slogans. Straight talking is far more effective and builds a lot of trust. And uh, we'll Farah is going to talk about trust in a little later in the workshop. So they like things that were involved working together, finding shared solutions. Um, and it was also very uh, Canadian findings of the, the projects, found that Albertans wanted to be seen very much as this was a collaborative approach to climate change across Canada. So they like open-mindedness and they like discussion. They still felt that oil and gas can contribute to a good quality of life. But there are other, other areas that they found were important in Alberta, that farming is important and tourism is important, that oil and gas shouldn't be the sole focus of discussions and debates. So there's a lot to be drawn out of these Alberta narrative projects, and it's one of the areas that I would definitely recommend taking a look at in more depth if you want to find out a little bit more. So before I start, I do want to acknowledge that I'm tuning in from the Greater Toronto Area region, which is home to many including the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, the Wendat people, and the of the Credit Nation. I do want to reiterate what Tristan mentioned in the beginning. So the two links that were mentioned, so whose land and native.ca, please do look up the territory that you're currently inhabiting and which treaties to govern it. Uh, so yes, my name is Bar Quaser. I'm currently a researcher and science communicator. So I'm doing genomics research at University Health Network and some research into federal science communication at Evidence for Democracy. So Tristan has spent quite a bit of time telling us about the concepts in science communication and really painting a picture of how broad this field is. 
And what I wanted to do was tie it together and kind of look at the bigger picture of where Canada's science communication landscape has been for the last decade. Now, before I start, I do wanna point out that Canada's science communication landscape has existed before 2010. So there have been many organizations that have been around for years, such as the Royal Canadian Institute for Science and the Canada Museum for, of Science and Technology. There are also lots of science centers across Canada, such as the Ontario Science Center, uh, Science North and Science World. There are obviously lots of programs and shows that revolve around science communication and science outreach. So things such as Quirks and Quarks, which is still running today. And then there are events and festivals revolving around science, such as Science Rendezvous, which was first launched in 2002. And if you kind of take a look at what's happened in the past decade, we see a lot of the similar patterns. So we see that there's Beakerhead a Festival, which is up in Calgary, if I remember correctly. There is also Science Literacy Week, which was launched in about 2014, 2015, which is a week-long celebration of science at the end of September. And fun fact, it was actually co-founded by Jesse Hildebrand, who is our evaluator lurking around in the chat here. There have also been international initiatives which have formed a chapter here in Canada. So for example, we have the Conversation Canada, we have the Story Glider, which is basically a show about true stories and science, which is in Vancouver, Toronto, and in a few other cities. We are also seeing more science communication training programs pop up. So there was the Banff Science Communication Program, there was a master's program launched in science communication at Laurentian University, and then just last year, NSERC announced the Science Communication Skills Grant to fund 20 projects across Canada, where fortunately we were able to win one and that's how we're delivering the workshops today. I also wanna point out that it's not just discoveries in science and kind of scientists who are driving science communication, it's also policy and politics that also prompts science communication. For example, you may remember that the conservative federal government did place some limitations on science communication, at least at the federal level. So scientists within the federal government weren't able to speak freely to the media about their research. And this actually prompted Stand Up for Science Rally. So scientists and the public kind of had this death of evidence march in Ottawa, where they were kind of protesting that science wasn't being able to be shared freely. Similarly, we've seen kind of efforts to map science culture and see what kind of policies are in place, what would be needed to move forward. This was a report that was commissioned uh, for the Council of Canadian Academies to complete, and it might be something interesting for you all to read. This was published in 2014, 2015. And of course, I wouldn't be able to complete the slide without acknowledging the fact that we're still living through the COVID-19 pandemic where we've really seen signs at the forefront of the pandemic and really informing a lot of the decisions and the public health decisions that have come out. We've seen scientists and science communicators heading to the media using different platforms like TikTok or Instagram to really get out there, share information and bust some uh, misinformation myths too. So altogether, the pandemic really has shown that being able to communicate science clearly and effectively is important. I also want to take a moment to just talk about opportunities in science communication here in Canada. I'm going to first start by saying that there are a lot of opportunities. I've really condensed them into general general generalities in this slide, but bear with me, there's a lot. I divided them into training opportunities, into opportunities to practice and kind of whether you want to forge your own path. In terms of training opportunities, you can kind of tick that one off because you're here today. Our seven workshop long program is really meant for you to kind of build those critical skills in science communication so that you can go off, practice and forge your own path. But if you are curious about learning more, uh, check out the courses in your at your university, check out programs. There are master's degrees dedicated to science communication, virtual or in person. There are also quite a few conferences. For example, in Canada, there is the Science Writers and Communicators of Canada conference. And there are a lot of virtual resources. For example, you could check out the open notebook for science writing. You could head to YouTube and kind of see the archived workshops that are already available or the talks from people like Timothy Caulfield. So there's no shortage of training opportunities. But at some point it's kind of like, 
you can train and you can keep training, but really when you're, what you're going to learn is through practice and by honing your skills. And for you, you may choose to pr uh, practice science communication in different ways. Perhaps it's public speaking. Maybe you're heading to a conference to share your research with scientists. Maybe you're heading to give a talk for the public. Maybe you're doing science outreach through something like Skype a Scientist or Let's Talk Science. And there's science writing for outlets like The Conversation Canada or science policy where you might be volunteering with a science policy organization or group. And the last one that I want to mention is forging your own path. So maybe you decide to form your own podcast. Maybe you want to create videos. Maybe you want to try something new like crocheting your science or knitting your science. There really are endless opportunities. I have what you call it, cited this uh, article called A Beginner's Guide to Science Communication Opportunities in Canada. So a lot of the organizations that I've mentioned are linked in there if you want to check it out. But for now, I just want to I guess the one thing I would say is like, don't be overwhelmed with the number of opportunities available. Like Tristan said, it's really about working out what your goal is and working backwards to figure out what the tactic and what are the steps that you would need to achieve that goal. But with that being said, you might be wondering, okay, there's a lot of science communication happening. There is a rich history of science communication across Canada. How is this kind of influencing public attitudes towards science and public trust in science and scientists? So I'm gonna pose that question to you in a minute, but before I do, I wanna give you a little bit of context to help you answer the Zoom poll questions that I have. So the Ontario Science Centre is a science centre here in Toronto, Toronto, Canada, and they've carried out two surveys previously to kind of gauge science literacy here among Canadians. In 2016, I've shown, I've kind of cherry picked data from 2016 and 2018 to give you kind of a flavor of what the attitudes towards science include. So for example, in 2016, the survey found that 40% of Canadians believe that the science behind climate change is still unclear or unsettled. 19% of Canadians believe that there is a potential link between vaccination and autism, which is not true. And 19% of Canadians rely on intuition rather than science to form their opinion on GMOs, genetically modified organisms. It isn't all negative. So if I take a look at the 2018 survey, you see a lot of curiosity and interest. So you see that 83% of Canadians want to learn about science and how it affects the world. 81% of Canadians agree that most people don't understand the impact of science on their everyday lives. And 54% of Canadians believe that society is turning away from science in favor of ideas that lack evidence or data. So again, I have cherry picked this data. I wanted to give you an idea of how public attitudes can vary depending on the question or the topic asked. But now I wanna pose the question to you. So we've made a lot of progress in science communication since 2000, 2010. We have a lot more scientists engaging in science communication in different ways. But now kind of given the current reality, how do you think public trust in science has fared? So Tristan is gonna launch two polls right now. The first poll is asking you in fall 2019, so before the pandemic, what percentage of Canadians do you think were skeptical of science? Feel free to vote. Uh, you can guess, you can make an informed decision entirely up to you. I'm going to share the results just so that you can see. So most people believe that it's 20% of Canadians who are skeptical of science. The next poll that Tristan is going to share is the same question, but how do you think that percentage has changed given the pandemic, specifically during summer 2020? There we go. So in summer 2020, during the pandemic, what percentage of Canadians were skeptical of science? So you can kind of take yourself back to summer 2020. There were waves of COVID-19 at that point. A lot of us were staying at home if it was possible, just watching everything play out. And remember, there was no hope of a vaccine then. We didn't know how long it would take or if it would take many years. And we were learning a lot about the virus too at that point. So again, 20 you voted that mostly 20% of Canadians were skeptical of science with the next ones being 30 and 25%. Okay. 
I can now share the results. So globally, if you take a look, when people were asked whether how much they agreed with the statement, I am skeptical of science, globally, that was at 35% before the pandemic. And it went down by seven points to 28%. So you can see that that skepticism in science seemed to have, got, uh, seemed to have decreased as a result of the pandemic. Specifically in Canada, it fell by eight points. So it was 35% uh, before and it went down to 28 or something. So most of you were on the right track with that one. I also wanna flag that in Canada, uh, there has been a marginal improvement when it comes to trust in science and scientists. So it's gone up to 91% for trust in science and 89% for trust in scientists. The other thing that I wanna ask you about is, so before the pandemic globally, climate change was the number one issue that people wanted science to solve apart from healthcare. So you kind of see the top five environmental issues on this slide, including climate change, air quality, ocean plastics pollution, clean water, and access to renewable energy. Other concerns had included hunger, relying on fossil fuels, uh, being able to recover from natural disasters, infrastructure, road safety, and so on. Specifically for Canada, 57% of Canadians wanted science to help solve climate change. So now my next question for you is, given the ongoing global pandemic, how do you think public priorities have changed, specifically when it comes to climate change? So Tristan will launch the poll in a few seconds, but the question is, so during the pandemic, how many percentage of Canadians do you think voted for climate change as their number one priority for science to solve? Oh, individuals across the world, not Canadians. So, most of you believe that it was 30% of individuals across the world who stated that addressing climate change was a top issue. The answer is a little higher. It was 51%. So healthcare remains a top priority right now during the pandemic. So 80% of people want to find a cure for emerging viruses. Around 62% want to find a cure for ongoing diseases. And of course, given the murder of George Floyd, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests across the US, STEM equity has become a prominent issue with 55%, but then there are 51% who do want science to be prioritized to mitigate the effects of climate change. And in case you're curious, that is 44% of Canadians who specifically wanted science to help mitigate the effects. So we've gone from 57% before the pandemic to 44%. And the reason why I wanted to highlight these findings is that this is kind of the context that you'll be communicating science from. This is how public attitudes towards science are right now and what their priorities are when they're thinking of science. So it's always good to remember, it's not just your goals, but you're communicating in the broader context of what's going on in the world. And you wanna be mindful of what are people's perspectives? What are they thinking about? What are their concerns? And as Tristan mentioned, there are a lot of other factors that influence your audience, but definitely, the current global context is always a good one to keep in mind. And with that, I do wanna end this workshop by talking about some current challenges in the science communication landscape. You might've come across some of these before and you've definitely come across the last one that I'll talk about today, but here we go. The first one is inclusive science communication. So you might've noticed that a lot of science communication is aimed at English speaking communities and especially for those who have access to internet, especially given the global pandemic. And it really points to the need for inclusive science communication, so reaching audiences that aren't the most accessible. I've taken this definition of inclusive science communication from a 2020 report, which describes inclusive science communication as all the efforts to engage specific audiences in conversations or activities about STEM, including but not limited to public engagement in formal science learning, journalism, and formal science education. So practically, what does that mean? I kind of see inclusive science communication as both an individual and a system, systemic approach. So on the individual approach, being inclusive means just being more considerate of how you can make your science communication activity more accessible. So you might've noticed that we're using captions. Uh, if me and Tristan were truly bilingual, this would have been in English and French, although our final slides will be translated. 
another, but if you're taking more of a systemic approach, you would think about expanding opportunities for multilingual engagement. So Canada is home to many diverse groups. Yes, English and French are our official languages, but there are so many different immigrants from who with a lot of different languages, such as Urdu, Arabic, Punjabi, Hindi, Portuguese, and so on. So kind of not always prioritizing English speaking groups or making sure that your science communication is translated and is available in different languages. Another way is to intentionally engage different audiences rather than the most successful. Given that you're all in a permafrost research network, you might be thinking about how to engage communities who are perhaps more remote or who are up in the north. How do you engage them when you can't just simply send out an Eventbrite uh, invite to kind of invite people in? Uh, we'll be talking more about this in the community engagement workshop. There's also the fact that you need to consider language. So jargon, I'm sure you've heard this before that you really need to be able to explain or contextualize your jargon because not everyone is going to know those very specific fields that are unique to your field. For example, I'm in genomics. If I start talking about structural variation or tandem repeat expansions, that's not going to make a lot of sense to people who aren't in my little field's niche. So really explaining and contextualizing jargon is really important because you want to share what you're saying, you want to be accessible, but you have to make sure that you're all at the same level and kind of explaining what you're sharing accessibly. That being said, taking care with the words you use is just as important. So the word significant is pretty common science. When you say significant, I'm usually thinking p-value and you've shown that your result is notable and significant. But outside of kind of the science field, significant just means important. So if I read this study had significant findings, I'm assuming all the findings that you're about to state in the next few sentences were significant, not really thinking about p-values. So you have to kind of consider how a term might have different meanings in science versus a lay language. And just as importantly, do be sensitive with the words you choose. So you might have noticed that it was there was a lot of war imagery being used during the pandemic. So things like, we're going to fight the pandemic, we're going to defeat the virus. But war imagery isn't the most accessible. Perhaps someone who's immigrated from a country which had war, they may not be as comfortable with words like that. So always considering your audience and just considering what words mean in different contexts is just as important. And the last thing that I want to point out is that science communication isn't just a knowledge deficit model. So a lot of scientists kind of assume that speaking and kind of sharing more facts and knowledge in a one way uh, mode is the way to go, but it's really a bi-directional mode of communication. So you might be sharing knowledge, but your audience may know things too. Well, they definitely know things too, and they might be able to help inform your research and science communication too. It's an opportunity for mutual learning and capacity building, so perhaps teaching new skills or gaining a local perspective on your research that you might have not considered before. And kind of these are all the components that really build inclusive science communication together. I'm mindful that it's almost four, which means it's time for the last part. And that is misinformation. It's a pretty strong and big um, crisis. It's not overblowing. It's definitely a crisis right now of misinformation that uh, science communicators face. So the first thing I wanted to do was kind of differentiate between the types of misinformation. So there's misinformation, there's disinformation, and there's malinformation. So misinformation is when you're sharing false information, but without intending harm. Disinformation is when you're knowingly sharing false information to cause harm. And malinformation is when it's genuine content that is shared to cause harm. So kind of the differences between all three really are whether that information is false and whether it's intending to cause harm. Misinformation is the word that you see around more often, but disinformation is generally the more insidious form. And I do want to point out that a lot of times we'll hear the word fake news being thrown around, but I do want to caution against using that term. I've cited here an op-ed from Dr. Katie Gibbs, who co-founded Evidence for Democracy. This was a, uh, an op-ed written in the Toronto Star in 2018. And she really lays out the case, as many other experts have done, to not use the term fake news anymore because it's been appropriated by politicians and it's often used to kind of dismiss facts or truth. And it doesn't really cover the different types of misinformation that you might see. 
So if there's anything that you walk away with today, I really hope that you stop using the word fake news. Instead, use misinformation, malinformation, or disinformation as appropriate. I do want to share what types of misinformation can include. So this is the seven types of mis and disinformation from first draft who are a really good source if you want to keep reading about misinformation. They've kind of shown what the different types can include, such as satire or parody. So something like The Onion, where you know all of the articles there are not real, they're parody. But if someone isn't aware that it's a parody site, that, act, that does have the potential to cause harm. There's misleading content, there's imposter content. So perhaps someone uh, impersonates a government website in terms of looks, and that kind of gives off that this is trustworthy content. There's fabricated content, which is entirely false. There's manipulated content. So especially in like the first few hours of breaking news, you can often see that videos that were associated with other events are kind of emerging and being claimed to be a part of the current event. There is false context and false connection. So false connection is definitely a bad one because you'll find that the headline doesn't actually match the content of the article, but no one knows because they haven't actually clicked the link to read more. So yeah, definitely a lot of types of misinformation. And you might be wondering why is misinformation harmful? Although I don't feel like I need to say it, but it is worth flagging anyway. So misinformation is harmful because it erodes public trust in institutions, it erodes public trust in facts, in the truth. And as you've probably seen in the last few months with the pandemic, or even just last week with what happened at the Capitol in the US, it's that misinformation has real life consequences and it does undermine democracy. So being able to identify misinformation and being able to tackle misinformation using evidence-based strategies is important. Um, this here is an infographic, which is from the uh, uh, University of Alberta's Faculty of Law, which shows strategies to tackle misinformation. So a lot of this is obvious, but it's always worth reiterating. The first is obviously to help stop the spread. So kind of consider what you're sharing first and take responsibility for the content that you're sharing, whether it's in your personal social media networks, something like WhatsApp, Instagram, or Twitter, or even through email, or also what you choose to click and like and engage with, because that also amplifies information. So always consider the body of evidence that's available on the topic and recognize that science evolves and check the sources used. If you find that it is a piece of misinformation, then you might find yourself in the position where you need to respond. How do you respond? Well, the simplest thing obviously is to report that post, whether it's to the regulatory body or if you're on a social media network, reporting that tweet, that post, whatever regulatory mechanism is in place you might find that you need to craft a message to counter that misinformation. So a lot of these strategies are obvious. So use facts from trusted sources, note whatever the scientific consensus is, highlight the gaps in logic, provide clear and shareable content because it's often noted that people are quick, that misinformation is quick to spread, but you don't see as many retractions and you don't see as many people sharing those retractions. And if you do end up making a mistake, the best practice usually is to actually delete that post and then share the correct information. Adding it as a message to that first post, not everyone will see it and it's only choosing to kind of bump up that first post again. Uh, other tips here are to be nice, authentic, empathetic, and humble. And it's also worth noting that debunking works. Obviously, when you're approaching someone to call out misinformation, you want to be nice and you want to give that person a way out. Perhaps they unwittingly shared misinformation. But keep in mind that it's not just the person that you're speaking to, but it's also kind of the overlookers in that social media space who might also be seeing that misinformation. So you're not just sharing that information to debunk that actual post, but for anyone else who might be viewing it. So debunking really does work and the misfire effects, the backfire effect. So the idea that if you debunk something, that person who you're speaking to kind of just holds on to that view even more tightly, it's actually overstated. So debunking is quite important. Uh, I wanted to open it up to the chat. So what are some examples of misinformation in your field? So feel free to drop a comment or a link into the chat. I do have an example, but I'm curious about 
which you'll share. Think about the examples that you want to share while I share one that was very interesting. So this is an example of misinformation about climate change. This post claims that um, the whole statistic of 97% of climate scientists concluding that humans caused, which call it climate change, is a lie and that there's in fact less of a consensus. It's they, this image shows kind of a petition saying that 30,000 American scientists have signed this petition, including 9,000 with PhDs. So just to be clear, this is false, this is not true. And what's interesting is that the study decided to take a look to see what are some different methods to tackle this misinformation and how can you and how long do these strategies last? So what they specifically did was they combined a scientific consensus message with an inoculation treatment and they exposed participants to the misinformation after one week. So specifically their consensus message was this. So 97% of climate scientists have concluded that human caused climate change is happening. So they either tested participants with just the consensus me message alone, or they did this message plus the inoculation message. So the inoculation message was just a lot of text saying, giving some context behind the consensus of saying nearly all climate scientists have concluded that human caused climate change is happening. Some politically motivated groups use misleading tactics and that there's virtually no disagreement. So these researchers looked at the consensus message alone, the inoculation message alone, and in both messages together. And they tried to see how long would these tactics last and what's kind of the best way to mitigate this information here. And what they found is that the consensus effect alone actually decayed over one week. And that if you, the misinformation message does counteract the, con the consensus message and does bring back the consensus to back line, baseline. And that if you use the inoculation message with the consensus message, you're able to protect the positive effects of the consensus message and you don't have any decay in inoculation effect over time. So kind of both a consensus message and an inoculation message were found to be helpful. I do wanna point out that this study was a replication of a study that had been done before. So they were able to replicate this finding. And it's interesting that it's not just one misinformation strategy, but kind of combining multiple approaches is kind of the way to go when you're addressing misinformation. And just for context, inoculation is the idea that you're sharing good, true information, kind of proactively addressing potential examples of misinformation that may occur. And with that being said, I do want to say that in terms of tackling misinformation, yes, there are a lot of individual approaches that you can do to take responsibility for what you share and to address examples of misinformation that pop up. But I also want to point out that it's not just individuals, that institutions also have a role to play. For example, national governments, media platforms, and technology companies have just as big of a role to play when it comes to addressing misinformation. Because it is four, I'm going to skip our poll everywhere. And I'm going to end with this question, which is, how will you choose to define science? So it's the same question that Tristan asked earlier. And now we're very curious to hear what you think and how you've decided to define science after today, as well as what your goals are in science communication. With that, I'm going to stop right there. Moving opinions from which there's no real basis and they're just opinions. So for example, if we think about the fake news or if we think about uh, the recent events politically in the US, um, what are the strategies to move people that have opinions or positions with little, if you want to say, scientific or argumentative facts to support those decisions or opinions? I mean, we're seeing a lot of it already in action. So you're seeing social media and technology companies finally shutting down platforms that are being abused. Uh, you're seeing, obviously, a lot of politicians I've noticed in their speeches right now are reiterating that the election was won fairly. So amplifying good news and using that inoculation method. Debunking is continuing. It's kind of the same strategies. Like there's no clean, like there's no one perfect approach. And then one of the things is really right. just that having this conversation more and more outside of our echo chambers, 
obviously with the pandemic, it's kind of limited how many of these conversations that you can have. So I'm curious to see how, I guess, people in the U.S. are going to approach having these conversations given the context of the pandemic. But I'm sure that you have opinions here too, Tristan. It's, yeah, I could say it's the question of our age. I say that, however, you know, I was... I'm often looking at um, you know past books and articles, and Carl Sagan dealt with a lot of the same challenges around maybe slightly different topics. The Demon Haunted World uh, is a fantastic book of his, and he covers a whole variety of approaches that scientists can take to address some of the the varied challenges that we face with exactly that sort of thing, where people have uh, viewpoints or ideas. Um, they're not, not based on uh, facts or, or rational, uh, scientifically supported evidence. And then, in fact, it's interesting, uh, in, in that book, the things that come up are things like alien abduction, which we don't hear a lot about nowadays. Um, and instead, we have things like QAnon conspiracy theories. And conspiracy theories or, you know, some of these other possibly, dare I say, the delusions or other um, uh, fantastical ideas people develop. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're part of human nature, and we're always going to find that they just change over time to new topics. But Carl, Carl lays out some very good you know, approaches for all of these, and it's, it's often a mixture. It's a mixture of having that evidence to support you know, your position. Honesty and integrity as we can see from the trust data, the general public that, that, you know, when you do a large survey of people, they trust scientists and we need to, you know, continue that by being honest and laying out the, you know, the processes involved in science and having, you know, having that integrity, I think really helps maintain trust. As long as we can maintain public trust, that's going to be really, really important. And appreciating, and, and I think there's been big strides towards this in the last um, century, if, if not the last 20 years, making science or the STEM fields a real part of our culture and, and uh, an appreciated part of our culture. I think when I, when I see a, a group of ladies, you know, sat knitting climate warming striped scarves, you, you really feel how you know, the work that scientists are doing are, are, are part of culture. And the, the, the sort of the knitting science movement um, really sort of took off. Uh, it's been going about 10 years. Uh, and it's not the only one. Everywhere you look, and I didn't really get time to say this, but the creativity in which people can engage with their science. I, you know, you can follow Instagram uh, people who make science cakes. I've seen, I've seen globes made so that they have the mantle layers uh, of the earth in a cake. And so there's just so many creative ways that you can make science a part of culture. And I think that that really helps. I think particularly for as people grow up, young people, um, to see that it's, it's all part of our, our, our culture and it's not a, a distinct little ivory tower over to one side. One thing that you might nice. want to, to um, consider uh, just in terms of talking about misinformation and especially with the um, in a northern context uh, and indigenous um, communication with indigenous uh, communities um, that yeah the the how yeah how science communication and traditional knowledge sharing how those intersect um, I know that, you know, especially the biologists um, in the Northwest Territories are, you know, working with Indigenous uh, groups to look at caribou herd populations and, and what we can do to, you know, um, to mitigate, uh, to mitigate that. And, and there, it's, it gets really tricky about what, you know, when you say, well, the indigenous population thinks, you know, that this, that it's because of um, the mines or because of wolves or this sort of thing. And you say, well, there's no scientific evidence. So, you know, that trumps that. 
Um, and you, you can't do that anymore. Um, and that's not, um, um, but so coming at it from this, you know, different ways of knowing and, you know, being careful about what, how, I, I'm curious to know how misinformation would fit into, uh, or traditional knowledge would fit into that sort of Venn diagram that you had on, uh, on um, yeah, malinformation, disinformation, and yeah, that sort of thing, because you can get a very um, Western science view um, and that can cause a lot of havoc when scientists come and start working with indigenous populations um, who have very intimate knowledge of, of the terrain here. Um, anyway, that's just a thought um, going forward or maybe you could incorporate some thoughts on that in your community engagement workshop. Um. The one thing I will say is that that it's going to show up in the community engagement workshop. We, I had to cut the slide that was actually going to talk about braiding Western and Indigenous knowledge just because, as you can see, the workshop was a little long. But yeah, that's a good question about how it would fit on the pie chart. I will say, though, the pie chart that I cited, the report that I cited from is like 150 pages long. It was a really interesting read. but. There's just so many terms and like so much to consider when you're coming to this whole misinformation landscape. But yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah you'd think maybe on that you'd have a, a, another intersection of perspective or culture um, or information base basis. Yeah, it probably um, wouldn't be a 2D diagram, something yeah. like that. Yeah, I, mean, I got to take off, guys. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll, I'll say goodbye. Care. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kumari. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, because I could think of that. Because I'm an engineer, I could think then of immediately of in the start of universities, um, the difference between France and Britain. Um, one was very empirical mentorship based, and the other one was more academic, uh, institutional based. When you, I can never pronounce it in French because I can't speak French. But the Pont de Chaussée, so the bridge and roads. Uh, university in Paris, and whereas in the UK it was primarily a, a mentorship, uh, empirical observation, and skill sets developed, but they landed eventually. So just in, maybe an interest in that perspective. I was going to argue with you, Tristan, though, maybe because I think the cake should be flat and rectangular pan, right? I, I don't know why you're insisting on this globe. Um. That's that's you know that's a great example. I think uh, I think it's it's faded a little, but uh, probably two or three years ago, um, the flat Earth um, you know ideas were really gaining a lot of traction. Um, they um, they they became sort of in vogue. Uh, it's fascinating <laughs> how some of these ideas come and go, um, or new ones emerge. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's it's a part of human nature and it's a part of our culture as well. And I think you know addressing them is important. Um, but I I wouldn't expect them to vanish forever. No. I don't think we can no. ever get rid of them. We just need to be aware of them. Um, yeah, I I can't remember quite now how they managed to bake a round cake. I thought that <laughs> I, I just yeah. remember that it was amazing. Uh, yeah. So cool. The other question I had as well, it relates to sort of a similar vein, but um, I don't even know what it's called, but I, maybe I'll just simply phrase it as just fatigue uh, messaging. So for whether it's climate change or now in the lockdown of COVID, um, what are some strategies as you're presenting and communicating how you get around that fatigue of hearing the same messages and then eventually people just tune out. I mean, the way I've seen it from science communicators on Instagram and on Twitter, so some people are still kind of repeating the same messages because kind of consistency is key and what we need to kind of tackle the pandemic hasn't changed. It's still washing your hands, keeping mm -hmm. your hands, wearing a mask. I've seen people really up their creativity though. So when it comes to TikTok videos and Instagram posts, okay. <laughs> dance moves, the music, the video that's just happening. So I think that's one of the tactics that people are using. 
And I think people are thinking more about how to reach what you call it broader audiences. So for example, there's the COVID-19 Resources Canada group. They launched this Science Explained series and they've really put the focus on different languages. So beyond English and French. They've also kind of moved into animated videos. Um, there's this science communicator in New Zealand, I uh, cannot pronounce her name, Sialzi, I think, Sialzi Wiles. She's been writing for a newspaper and she pairs up with this uh, designer who creates these really accessible GIFs and they're very easy to share. So what I'm kind of seeing is there's some people who are sticking to what they know best and it works. And then there are some people who are kind of really innovating the different types of science communication they're using to, to kind of reach a broader audience. So more of the same and some new things too. Yeah, I think um, Thanks. Farah's hit on exactly a lot of what I would have said. You know, there's a huge amount of creativity nowadays. Um, there's always someone coming up with something. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. That's really cool. And it catches your attention. Um, I think also if, if there are issues, say, like uh, climate change, um, then not, not, I, you know, unfortunately, I'm using a sort of a, a more analogy here, but um, you have to approach it from a lot of different angles, you know, and, and the, the hearts and minds aspect is really, really important. Um, but you, you need to have the logistics and, you know, you need to have all of the, the organizations, departments all, all working together. Um, so you need, you know, some of that messaging to be adopted by the government at the high level so you know that those consistency of messages are there and, and people are, you know, they see that authority of accepting climate change is real. And I think we see in, you know, south of the border that some of the impacts when the, the science is disregarded and it's not adopted at a high level. Um, and and yeah, they all feed together, they all come together. So, you know, there are countries around the world where there's a, a very different approach um, to science um, and the way you might find in northern Scandinavian countries or northern European countries um, where, you know, the, the public's views and opinions and the institutions and the government are much, much closer, much more aligned. The way that that society then operates is, is just different. Um, and, then, and I think you see some of that in the difference between Canada and the United States of America. Um, we, I think here in Canada, have a, a you know a bit more of a coherent um, you know messaging and an understanding of the value of science. 